Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, I realized that a lot of what we do is talk about events uh, on this channel. Um, if you're new to the channel, I do reaction videos, but they're really more of just taking uh, this fantastic original content that other history channels do and using them as our textbook to expand on a topic and talk more about it and go in more, more in depth about it. But I realized that a lot of times we're talking about people or events and we're not talking about necessarily ideas in context. So for example, we might talk about a battle in the Civil War and we might talk a lot about brigades and divisions, but we never really take a lot of time to talk about what that means. What is a brigade? What is a division? How do they get organized? What's the difference between the regular army and the volunteer army and uh, those kinds of things? So we're going to do some videos in the, uh, both today and in the near future, kind of exploring some of those topics. Uh, and today is actually going to be one, uh, my first time doing a reaction to a channel called Sand Roman History. Uh, there was a reference made to them in yesterday's video uh, about being a great topic for this, and I didn't realize I was actually already subscribed to them. Uh, but this one's called How to Raise a Medieval Army. Because the idea of a standing army as we know it today is very different than how armies were constituted and organized and recruited and raised and, and taken into fighting in the medieval period, where you didn't have a standing army that existed in the field for years at a time like you do in World War II or in other places. So I thought it'd be an interesting topic to dive into. I don't know what to expect. I've never done a reaction or watched any of his videos before, but he has come highly recommended to me. So uh, I want to give a shout out and a thank you to Graham in St. Leonard's on the Sea in the UK. Uh, and Ari in Renton, Washington, thank you both so much for your support on Patreon. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. The link is in the description to the original content if you want to check it out without my commentary. Contrary to popular belief, armies in the Middle Ages were not just made up of knights in shining armor who brought along their small retinue of peasants to the battlefield. The reality was that medieval armies were assembled in a variety of ways, depending on their purpose and various other factors. This video explains how to raise a medieval army in Europe for an offensive campaign outside one's own borders. And it's interesting to think about this because I've mentioned this before, but the, the modern idea not only of, a, of an army, but of a nation uh, is a modern idea. Uh, much more at this time period, it's about people. You had an army that served a person or the land on which they lived but not necessarily the nation. There was no army of England, for example. And very often the king of England, even though he ruled the country, was not necessarily the keeper of the most powerful potential army that existed. And that's why sometimes you have issues uh, that uh, result from that. The first crucial step was to start planning ahead of time. A wise king would begin to organize the next year's campaign as early as in autumn or winter. Then, at some point late in the year, let's say, a court held at Christmas, he would gather the men he would be going to rely on for planning and executing his campaign and tell them about his intentions. These men would then bring the news of the impending war to their estates, so that preparations could be made. Usually, they had all winter to prepare, because war was seasonal in the Middle Ages. Because the weather war has been seasonal for most of human history, but yeah, it was absolutely the case in the Middle Ages. Even you know, as recently as the 20th century, that's been the case. Look at when most of the major offensive happened in World War One. It was in the spring or in the summer. Uh, the American Civil War. Very little happening during the winter months. Occasionally you had things like Fredericksburg uh, happens in December, but the weather was actually pretty good that day. And the armies had already been in place before the weather got bad in the first place. Uh, Petersburg, basically, uh, they were all just waiting for the roads to clear up so they could go and finish off Lee's army. Uh, same thing in 1864, Grant was waiting for May for good weather to be able to start moving toward Richmond. Logistics more difficult and diseases posed a severe threat in winter, campaigns were carried out in spring, summer and autumn. For these reasons, medieval armies tended to assemble no sooner than in early May or even later. The composition and organization of an army varied wildly depending on time, place and purpose. Private wars, feuds or border raids, for example, differed fundamentally from what we are looking at here. 
Because of this great variety, we need to simplify things and highlight the central features of raising an army in the Middle Ages. This is to say, please be aware that in the next few minutes we will provide you only with a general overview of the techniques of recruitment in the High and Late Middle Ages. To do so, we streamline the findings of modern historiography. In most cases, an official call-up was issued by the Royal Chancellery about two months before the start of the campaign. In this royal order, time and place of gathering were announced to the most powerful people in the realm. And so this is important to realize when you think about the fact that you're not really going to have a lot of surprise attacks that happen, right? Because months in advance, you are announcing and calling these guys up. And so uh, that's why you have much, much greater instance of pitched battles in which both armies have had time to gather and move to a place and even might even be sitting there kind of facing each other for a while before the actual battle takes place. Visualized as a pyramid, the top layer consists of archbishops, bishops, counts, masters of orders, barons, abbots, princes, and royal officials such as sheriffs, seneschals, and magistrates. As soon as these men received the king's order, they began to prepare and gather their retinue. A king or prince drew mainly on three types of troops, namely feudal levies, mass levies and external contingents, that is, mercenaries and the troops of dependents and allies. Most of the mounted troops, which were considered the most important part of a medieval army, were recruited through feudal levies. In feudal structure, And the mounted troops and of course the knights are... There, there's such a, a degree of difference between your, your common kind of foot soldier armed with a pike or something and your mounted knight just in terms of the costs involved just to outfit a knight and his horse with the armor and the weaponry that he was using i mean could often be uh, the cost that is more than what that regular mass levy troop would earn in his lifetime and so, yeah, I mean, you, you have knights go into battle and, and they're going to get, you know, their kill to death ratio, so to speak, is going to be really high because you are so much better equipped and armed than the common soldier could ever be. Structures, some lords called tenants in chief, were granted lands or fiefs directly by the king. In return, they owed him a general assistance, had to advise and support him at court or at war. They owed him a defined contingent of fighters, usually between 5 and 500 men at arms, depending on the size and significance of their fiefdom. Often, they would bring even more than what was required to win the favor of the king or to show off their power and wealth. Strictly speaking, the term feudal levies can only be applied to the late Middle Ages. When and so why would they want to do more, right? Because if you conquer land, there's new land and territory and wealth to be given out, and it's up to the king, it's up to your feudal lord to decide who gets that. And so the more you do for him to win, the more reward you're likely to get. Uh, so, you know, there's plenty of incentive for wanting to do that. Um, and, and it all goes back to the idea that everything you have really comes at the king's pleasure or at your lord's pleasure, and it can all be taken away and given to other people, and it very often was. And most medievalists agree, a feudal military structure actually existed. Guy Halsell, for example, one of the leading researchers on the transitional period from late antiquity to the early Middle Ages, has coined the term vertical recruitment to better encompass hmm. all forms of recruitment based on Lord Vessel relationships. Using this term allows us to include all different kinds of relationships that were used to summon soldiers in the Middle Ages. We will get back to this again in the next chapter of the video. When a tenant-in-chief was summoned to join an army, he had his work cut out for him. He had to raise money for the upcoming venture and make preparations for his absence. After all, he would be away from his lands for a long time. In and so and the, the money is to get you going and to feed the army and things like that, not necessarily to pay your troops. If they got paid at all, it was in loot that they got from... Uh, conquests and from defeating enemies and things like that. And that's, again, a very common thing, even up until, say, the American Revolution, for example, where uh, they were supposed to be getting paid, Continental soldiers, but they weren't really. And many times what they were given instead was uh, either these certificates to be redeemed after the war was won or in promises of land and things like that. 
some cases even longer than half a year. Besides this, a magnate's most important task was to assemble his retinue. While he would be taking pretty much any man fit for service in the case of a defensive war, a more careful choice was made for an offensive campaign. He needed capable men at his side, but even more capable ones to manage his lands in his absence. Moreover, the selection of the retinue often had a political dimension, because the potential participants were also the constituents of the magnet. Therefore, he was obliged to look after their interests. While some were eager to go to war with him, others preferred to stay at home. These uh, you can almost think of it like a pyramid scheme, right? You got the king and then you might have dukes or barons or uh, earls or what, depending on the time period and the country that you're in. Uh, and then you've got, you know, folks under them and, and everybody in that pyramid owes something above them and owes something below them unless you're at the top or the very bottom. Wishes had to be taken into consideration. Normally, the war household of a prince was composed of men from his immediate environment. On one hand, there were non-combatants, such as servants, wagoners, cooks or scribes. There were also doctors and surgeons, who were usually recruited from outside. On the other hand, a significant part of the combatants of the retinue was recruited from the household. Some of them were professional fighters, such as soldiers of the house troops, bodyguards or weapon instructors, but also the holders of non-military offices such as administrators, advisors or hunters, who were expected to provide armed service because of their social status or office. Only few tenants-in-chief had sufficient household troops to fulfill their duty to the king with those alone. This was not a problem, however, because they in turn had lent land to lesser magnates who owed them support in return. So again, there you have the kind of both ways that it works, right? You have people below you that you have to be responsible for, that owe you something, but then you also have to give them something in return. They could now fall back on these men, so that the whole procedure was repeated on a lower level and on smaller scale. So the king called upon his tenants-in-chief for allegiance. They summoned the magnates who were subordinate to them. And the magnates in turn called upon, for example, the knights residing in their dominions. Theoretically, this could go on for a long time, but according to the historian Clifford Rogers, cases in which more than four order summons were issued were rare. In many cases, however, even this was not enough to fill the tenant-in-chief's contingent, so that they had to resort to troops outside the feudal chain of dependency. In most cases, relatives and acquaintances who were not mastered themselves volunteered to fill the ranks. If a vassal had the wherewithal to recruit additional troops, in addition to the costly task of raising and equipping his retinue, mercenaries were a possible solution, too. These were often needed when local lords refused to fight wars abroad because venturing beyond one's country was quite the adventure mm. in the Middle Ages. Even though it could make a soldier incredibly rich, it was very risky. While the call-up was passed down the feudal dependency pyramid, the men-at-arms began to prepare. They usually had to provide and finance all their own equipment, including mounts, weapons, armor and personnel, mm. since they had already been paid in form of their fiefs, just like their lords. And this is also another thing that we kind of take for granted, right? You think today, well, of course that stuff gets provided for them, but even in most of American military history, men were responsible, for example, for replacing their own uniforms that would come out of their pay sometimes. Uh, so yeah, this was, again, you're being called to serve someone else, but you also still have to provide for yourself. Although the men-at-arms were considered the central part of a magnet's retinue, they usually made up only a fraction of it. An important lord would lead dozens or hundreds of men into war. According to the historian Clifford Rogers, the contingent of an average baron might have included about 100 horses and 50 men, of which about three were knights and nine squires, each of whom again brought their own servants and retinues. In addition to the men-at-arms, these included armorer, craftsmen, pages, cooks, stewards, clergymen, musicians, heralds, and many more. In most cases, almost all men except the nobles had a dual function. Many servants fought as infantrymen or archers, in addition to their duties in the camp. The feudal he made another really good point there as he talked about, uh, he's been talking about things like doctors and clergy and servants and all that stuff like that. Very often when you see numbers, even in modern times, numbers of men 
in the field for an army or in, you know, in the order of battle for an army, that includes a lot of people who aren't fighting. So even things like, again, using the American Civil War as an example, uh, more often than not, cavalry traveled on horseback but would fight on foot. And even in places like Kentucky, you didn't really have standard infantry regiments. Most of the infantry regiments in Kentucky were mounted infantry. So they had horses, but they fought on foot. And so if you're fighting on foot, you need people to hold your horses, so to speak. And uh, so like one in four of the men were holding the horses for the, for the others. And so right away, if you've got a thousand men, you've really only got 750 that are fighting because the other 250 are holding the horses. But then you have cooks and you have um, men who are serving as basically as medics. And you have people who are messengers and couriers and you have uh, headquarters guards and all these sorts of things. And you have to protect supply lines and all of that. And so that number that you see that an army has does not really tell you the real story of how many men they actually have to fight. Levies of the late Middle Ages and earlier forms of vertical recruitment were the core element in raising an army for an offensive campaign. They brought most of the men-at-arms and many of the soldiers to an army, but there were other ways of recruiting men as well. The second main source of soldiers was the so-called horizontal recruitment. This refers to all direct calls for service from the ruler to his free subjects, rather than through the pyramid of lord-vassal relationships. The best known form of this are militias. Of course, a horizontal call to arms could not work via individual letters, as was the case with feudal levies. Instead, they were proclaimed by royal officers within their jurisdiction. In the early Middle Ages, these were usually counts, who at the time were not yet holders of a high noble title. Later, they would be. For example, sheriffs in England, bailiffs in France, or mayors or city councillors in the Holy Roman Empire. However, since such summons... Yeah, uh, and, and mayor sounds like a small thing to us now, but uh, in some cases, the, the people who ended up ruling the Holy Roman Empire were mayors at, at different times. It's, it's fascinating to think of how certain titles that in modern times, they're important, but they're not like super high level important. Much had a much more um, influential role. Were often only used in an emergency. In many cases, there was no time for formalities and the call was made in a very simple way, for example, by ringing bells or lighting beacons. While vertical recruitment and feudal armies in general clearly revolved around mounted men-at-arms, horizontal recruitment was primarily aimed at recruiting infantry, although neither was exclusive. The men recruited by horizontal methods were selected from an armed population. According to the historian Clifford Rogers, it was common from the 12th century or earlier that all free men fit for service were required by law to maintain arms and armor proportionate to their wealth. In order to check compliance with these requirements, there were musterings, competitions, and training sessions from time to time. That's another thing that has been true for most of history that's different now, right? Uh, there was an expectation, even up till a couple hundred years ago, that uh, if you were an able-bodied man you were part of the potential uh, fighting force for your local community or your lord or your nation. Uh, and you were required to be prepared with a weapon, whatever the weapon would be for your time period, so that if the call-up happened, you were ready to go. And you didn't even need to be equipped. You didn't need to be trained. That had all already been done. And I was thinking back to something I said a few minutes ago, and I know somebody will correct me if they haven't already. And when I was talking about mayors being influential parts of the Holy Roman Empire, I think it really predates the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, we're looking at some of the guys who are like ancestors of folks like Charlemagne, for example. The time in many regions. Because of this, a king who wanted to raise an army was able to muster a large number of men in a very short time. However, the troops raised in this way were often poorly trained, motivated rather moderately and inadequately equipped. Yeah. So their military value was often small. Coordinating them entailed great logistical difficulties, which is why they were usually deployed only for a short time and mostly in their home region, 
In Spain, for example, each household had to provide a soldier in the case of a so-called apelido, a call by the king, but he had only to be provisioned for three days. Though limited in range and capability, such mass musterings could bring together a large number of infantrymen quickly. Thanks to that, this type of recruitment remained very important until the late Middle Ages and beyond. So if you've ever played a game like Crusader Kings, for example, you know exactly what this is like. You raise your levies and you can raise a massive amount of men for a short time, but you keep them in the field more than a couple months and it starts hurting you and it costs you and, it, and it's very difficult. And again, even though we're talking about medieval period, this is again something that was true even in, say, the American Revolution. In the American Revolution, the United States did not have a large army in the field for the entire war, like the British did, where the British were bringing regulars over and they were in the field for a long time. Uh, if you look and start, if you research men who served in the Revolution, and I've, I've researched hundreds of them, um, most of them will say, well, I served for four months in 1778 in this unit, and then in 1779 I served for three three months in this other unit, and then in 1780 I was uh, in this position for two or three months. And you know, There were very few men who were like regular soldiers who were in for a long period of time. A lot of these guys served six or seven different times for a couple of months out of the year. They had to go home and do their harvest. They went home for the winter. They came back in the spring campaign season or they were raised as militia when there was an immediate threat and then they went home when that threat subsided. Especially in frontier areas. However, there were also cases in which troops for offensive warfare were raised in a similar way. In 9th century Francia, for example, all free men who owned three or more farm plots, so-called hmm. manzi, had to enlist when the king planned an offensive campaign. With great power comes great responsibility. Those who owed less land had to pool their resources and equip one man for every three manzi by proxy. Similar systems existed, for example among the Lombards in Italy and the Anglo-Saxons. Those who were selected had an important public duty to perform and were therefore supported by their local community. And this was important too because it gave you a fairly good idea of what your potential recruitment pool was. If you knew that there was going to be one man for every three farms, then based on how many farms you had, you knew exactly how many men you had potentially to be able to go into the field for you. During the 10th and 11th centuries, royal authority declined in favor of the power of nobles and towns. The idea that subjects should support their king in offensive warfare declined, and in many places disappeared altogether. The notion that the obligation to participate in a military expedition could only come from a personal or contractual relationship that is precisely by feudal ties, for example, quickly gained a lot of attraction after the 12th century. But in the 14th and 15th century, even those who had held a fief were no longer always obliged to serve outside the borders of the realm. Still, service was sometimes offered to the king in hope for rewards or because of promising benefits if a campaign was going to be successful. That's a great point too, is that even though we're talking about the medieval period, which is a several hundred year stretch, things look differently from one part of that period to the next and it looked differently from one place to another depending on the system they were using depending on whether it was a duchy or a kingdom or an empire or what part of the world they were in but service could no longer be demanded sometimes the ruler's right to conscript subjects could also be authorized by a representative assembly for example the english parliament or the catalan courts one ruler who made frequent use of horizontal recruitment for offensive warfare was Edward III of England. He repeatedly recruited large contingents for short service periods of 40 days. One of the orders he issued to his so-called commissioners of array, who mustered the troops on his behalf, illustrates the mechanism of summoning armed people. Edward ordered, quote, to array all men aged 16 to 60 in the county of Nottingham, horses as well as footmen, and put them into thousands, hundreds, and twenties, and from them select 500 archers and 200 hobelars, light horsemen, from the strongest and fittest of the men of said country. These men. It's, it's really cool that we have, and the, the British archives have like so much of this stuff going back a good thousand years or more. 
uh, these exact descriptions of what was happening. And you have to remember, too, that in Edward III's day, not only is he fighting the Hundred Years' War against the French, but he's also dealt with plague that has killed a third to one half of Europe's population. And so you're missing farmers and craftsmen and military men and noblemen and everything. And were then to be equipped and sent to fight the Scots in the Scottish Wars of Independence. While normally the summons intended that only the strongest and fittest be mustered, quite often those who actually enlisted were the most willing. This could happen for a variety of reasons, but mainly because the men selecting the recruits were themselves involved in local society and therefore were considerate of the wishes of the potential combatants. The king's interest of finding the best fighters wasn't endangered by this, because men fighting deliberately were almost always a more valuable addition to the army than those compelled to serve. Knowing that unmotivated soldiers weren't particularly useful, it was sometimes even possible to pay a fee in lieu of personal service. This and that's something that still existed up through the American Civil War. American Civil War guys who were drafted could pay a substitute to go in their place. Uh, pretty common thing. And it the ultimate example of rich man's war, poor man's fight, right? Um, but motivation is such a key factor. I mean, you have two otherwise equal armies on the battlefield, and the, the more highly motivated soldier is going to win almost every time. Uh, that's one of the things that doesn't get said enough about great leaders. Uh, people like Napoleon. Napoleon was a fantastic motivator of not only his officers, but the common soldiers, the, the common man, the men in his army, the, the privates and the corporals and things like that, they fought for him because they believed in him and they felt like he cared about them. They called him the little corporal. It was it was a affectionate uh, uh, title that they used for him because they felt like he was one of them. This could then be used to pay for a capable and motivated replacement. It can be concluded, as does Clifford Rogers, that the majority of those recruited horizontally served voluntarily or at least willingly. The troops selected this way were ordered to report at a specified place near the border of the country or region, where their equipment was completed and improved by the country community who either provided it directly or paid for it. In addition, the men received pay for the march and in many cases were provided with a coat of uniform colors as a distinguishing mark, for example, red and white, for the men of Norwich in 1385. With these horizontally recruited troops, the second important component of a medieval army was ready and on the march to the assembly point. Since in many cases, even vertical and horizontal recruitment wouldn't score sufficient troops for an offensive campaign, it was advisable to tap into other resources. These included mercenaries and troops of dependents and tribute payers and the contingents of allies. The contingents of allies and dependents were in most cases composed of vertically recruited troops too, and were rarely supported by militias. And one of the other things that you might need to go externally for is if you needed some kind of specialist, right? So maybe you needed some Welsh bowmen, or maybe you didn't have enough heavy cavalry, or you needed more of a certain type of soldier for the fight that you were going into. This was due to the fact that a ruler had little claim on the support of his population when fighting a so-called voluntary war than when defending the interests of the homeland. As of the 13th century, sometimes even before, Rulers would also hire mercenaries off the shelf, which means in the form of already existing companies. The individual mercenary was thus usually recruited by a mercenary captain, and not directly by the ruler. In some cases the mercenary captains also recruited additional fighters, specifically for a particular commission. Mercenaries could be some of the most efficient troops, but they were also very expensive mm. and had a tendency to spark quarrels. Still. If one could afford them, they were a valuable addition to any army. So why would they spark quarrels? Well, they don't have the same motivation other than money to serve you. And they could just as easily serve someone else. And they're really just in it for themselves. I mean, they really, they don't have to go back home with you. They don't have to serve under you when the war's over. They don't have to answer to the people back home for whether or not they stayed loyal. There's a lot of external factors there that complicate that relationship. With these additional troops, all major sources of soldiers had been tapped. Now, the men called up and recruited prepared themselves as best as they could and marched to join the army. After what was often a long and arduous march, 
they arrived at the place of assembly and reported for duty. If everything had gone according to plan, the king would look upon an army of men who had flocked together for a great many, yet very similar, motivations. His vassals and retinues, the militiamen, mercenaries and support troops were ready to go to battle. If you are planning to raise your own army anytime soon, be aware that modern tenants are usually not obliged to enlist for armed service. <laughs> Please use the information provided responsibly and consider giving us a share of your spoils by joining the host of our Patreons. Nice. That was cool. So, as you can see here, some of the other uh, stuff that he does, he does a lot of these types of videos where rather than talking about a specific event, he talks more about backgrounds and ideas and, and types of armies and types of weapons and types of tactics. And, uh, so, it's actually pretty interesting, and I could see us doing some of these other ones. So, if you check out his channel, it looks like he's got a whole bunch of stuff on the 30 Years War. We may have to dive into that one because that's something I want to learn more about. So, let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. And uh, I want to give a shout out to Adam in uh, Ilkston uh, in the UK and also Travis in Athens, Michigan. Thank you guys so much for your support on Patreon. And right now I'm recording a bunch of videos ahead of time before I head to France uh, to make some original content. So if you are a member or a patron at any level, you will get to see these videos a day early. Thanks for watching.